Hello and welcome to our educational webinar on understanding fixed income ETFs, liquidity risks, unique opportunities and how they fit in your portfolio. I'm Rachel Revis, staff writer at ETF.com in Europe and I'm joined by our in-house expert and analyst Spencer Bogart as well as financial advisor Stephen Walters who runs a service called Which ETF? Together we will be exploring the asset class of fixed income and specifically how it works within the wrapper of an exchange traded fund. Before we start, just a few housekeeping things. You can ask questions at any time throughout the webinar. Simply type your question in the box at the bottom right corner of the screen. We will record this session and you can listen to it later on our website as playback. Finally, this session is CPD accredited and all participants will receive an email with instructions on that. So to start off, what is fixed income? Sounds like an obvious question. Fixed income is an important part of a diversified part portfolio. It's generally regarded as lower risk than equity as it produces a regular yield or a coupon with the relative guarantee of you receiving your invested capital back at maturity. But there are risks and we will go over that later. But for an example, interest rate risk or call risk, which means investors rushing for the exit in a downward market and causing the underlying assets to become illiquid. So this is a very simple graph, a trend chart, but it shows a simple point that ETF assets have grown phenomenally over the years. ETFs are completely changing the way that investors can access fixed income. Instead of spending large sums to hold bonds and debt directly or investing in an actively managed mutual fund, retail investors and their advisors can now purchase this asset class cheaply and in small quantities via shares on a stock exchange. From the first European government bond ETF by index change in 2003, there is now a comprehensive range of ETF exposure in the asset class. This covers everything from corporate covered bonds, credits, inflation, high yields, investment grade, and emerging market debt. So assets in fixed income ETFs are clearly soaring. From £801 million pounds in Europe in 2003, they've grown to £73 billion in 2014, according to data from Deutsche Bank. So moving on, what does a fixed income ETF actually do? These days, you don't have to buy bonds individually or invest in an opaque active managed fund. A fixed income ETF is relatively cheap and transparent and priced in the same way as equities, with fund shares trading intraday according to supply and demand. Another upside of the ETF structure to note is that an advisor can always see how much their client's investment has gone up and down, even in periods of market stress as the shares are on exchange. However, with an actively managed mutual fund, the advisor might not be able to see this immediately. Often, the underlying benchmark or holdings are only published every so often. To sum up this slide, the ETF enables fixed income to become a more active part of asset allocation, and it is no longer limited to just those wealthy buy and hold investors. A very important point is understand the benchmark with any ETF you're invested in. There are a multitude of fixed income ETFs available, so it's important to focus on the underlying benchmark and fully understand. Some indices, for example, may comprise of only one kind of bond and will therefore be less diversified. For example, the Lixor ETF IBOX Sterling Liquid Corporate's Long Dated ETF is a bit of a mouthful. It just constitutes of 40 large liquid bonds, but that means that just one bond default would have a massive impact on your returns. On the other hand, if you invest in something from Spider like the Barclays Sterling Corporate Bond ETF, it tracks 600 holdings. It also has an aggregate bond ETF, which includes gilts, and that has around 900 issues. So generally speaking, the more diversified your index, the less risk that a bond default would have on the fund and the advisor's end client. So I mentioned risks earlier, and there are a few of them, which we'll go through now. Interest rate risk is the main threat for a retail investor in a fixed income ETF. This is because interest rates are at record lows in the UK, Europe and the US and it is likely we will see a rise in interest rates this year or next, especially in the UK. And as you may know, bond prices tend to go the opposite way to interest rates. And with low interest rates, your total expense ratio of your ETF can eat your yield and you can just end up with credit risk, which is the second risk on the list. But there is a guide to help you with credit risk. Bonds are tiered into categories of credit quality, and this varies from investment grade at the safest level to junk bonds at the lowest level or the highest level of risk. 
a credit rating is applied to the bond and its issuer, excluding government bonds. However, even rating agencies can get it wrong, as was seen in the financial crisis of 2008. So if your ETF is yielding a high amount of, say, 6%, there is a reason for that. The underlying asset is potentially risky. You're not getting a free lunch. Liquidity risk, third on the list, is another important consideration. Bonds are priced over the counter, OTC, which means they are bought and sold directly between institutions rather than on a transparent stock exchange. This makes it harder for advisors to judge the true liquidity or value of the underlying holdings in your fixed income ETF. So how can you measure liquidity? You should look at the average daily trading volume. This means how much the ETF shares are traded on exchange. Bond funds liquidity is much harder to assess in equities as the bond might not trade for a while, or information on the bond's value is temporarily unavailable, whereas you will always know the level of the FTSE 100. And the more liquid the underlying assets, the cheaper the ETF will be, generally speaking. This is because the spread, which is the difference between what you pay to get in and out of the fund, will narrow if the fund's assets are liquid. Finally on this list is the widening spread. You should be aware, as it depends, it can widen and narrow depending on the market environment. For example, there were mass redemptions from high-yield ETFs last summer when there was speculation over the US Fed's plans to taper money printing. At moments of high volatility or with less liquid bonds, especially high-yield, investors should think carefully about whether or not they want to trade. After all, there's not going to be a big impact just by holding the ETF unless you trade at the wrong moment. Spread on a high-yield ETF could widen significantly, also depending on the time of day. It is much narrower on large investment-grade ETFs with high trading volumes on the secondary market. So what are the costs? Aside from the spread when you buy in or sell out of the fund, fixed-income ETFs are quite cheap in Europe. They are also generally cheaper than actively managed mutual funds. This reflects data compiled from market this year. It found the average price of a fixed income ETF in Europe is around 0.21%, that's 21 basis points, compared to the average equity ETF, more expensive, around 0.31%. This can be drilled down further, however. The average money market ETF in Europe is only 0.1%, and the average high yield ETF is nearer 0.5%. My final slide is just five basic points to watch out for when you are considering investing ETFs in fixed income. The first, look at the overall cost of the ETF, not just the total expense ratio, which doesn't cover everything. What is the all-in fee? Second, look closely at the underlying index. Does it provide broad and diversified coverage? Third, check when the fund was launched and look for funds that have been on the market for as long as possible. This is for two reasons. Tracking error is usually higher during the first six months of trading, plus a long track record means you can also check out performance. Well, fourthly, assess liquidity. Look at the fund's assets under management, as well as the da daily trading volumes on, of its shares. And finally, make sure the spread is tight. Fixed income returns are weak at the moment. Therefore, trading costs become even more important. So now I'm going to hand over to our true expert, Spencer Bogart, who will talk more on exposing fixed income opportunities. Thank you, Rachel, for that great introduction to fixed income. I'm going to tie some of that together with ETFs and discuss some of the opportunities with fixed income ETFs, some of the challenges that portfolio managers have tracking fixed income indices, and some of the ETFs that are available. And it's funny because when you think about the typical 60-40 view of a portfolio, we've differentiated on the equity side for decades. We've sliced and diced the market by size, by sector, by geography. But the other 40%, the fixed income side, for a lot of investors has been treated as a homogenous blob. And really, fixed income deserves better than that because it's really a composition of several segments that aren't strongly correlated to each other. And the advent of ETFs have really pushed this differentiation to the fore because we now have liquid, transparent, low-cost vehicles that are trading all day on an exchange, and we just need to reach out and grab them. Now, this is a tremendous opportunity for the advisor community in particular because they can tailor client portfolios to unique and precise investment objectives at a low cost. But before I go further, I think it would be a fair question to step back and say, why would you want to own a diversified fixed income portfolio to begin with? And my answer to that question is because 
every dog has his day. This chart here shows the top performing fixed income segment in any given year from 2005 to 2012, the best performing fixed income segment being at the top. Now what we see from the random assortment of colors here is that there's no consistency as far as the top performing fixed income segment. So unless you have a crystal ball and you know what's going to be the best performer next year, this strongly suggests that you might want to own a diversified portfolio comprising multiple fixed income segments. Plus, why not add the diversification and risk reduction benefits that come from owning a diversified fixed income portfolio? Because even though we think of the bond market as one, what we see from this correlation matrix here is that the individual segments of the fixed income market are not strongly correlated to each other. And lastly, because there's tons of opportunities here. Today the fixed income market includes opportunities in diverse sectors that allow investors to enhance performance, mitigate risk, and improve their efficiency. Not only that, they're liquid, transparent, and low cost. So again, we just need to reach out there and trade them. But first, it would also be another fair question to ask, for my fixed income exposure, why do I need to go to a bond fund to begin with? Why not just go out, go buy a few sovereign bonds, and call it a day? And the reason really comes down to economies of scale. And in this case, economies of scale really manifest themselves in two ways, diversification and trading costs. Now the first, diversification comes because if you wanted to build a diversified fixed income portfolio for your client, you'd either need a very large sum to begin with, or you'd need to build that diversified portfolio over a very long period of time, and of course, incurring idiosyncratic risk in the meantime. But with a fixed income ETF, you can get instant diversification for just the, the handle of one single fund. And not only that, the other way the economies of scale manifest themselves is through trading costs. As I'm going to go into later in the presentation, the bond market is very different than the equity market and it's very costly to access. And if you were to try and build a diversified fixed income portfolio, you'd likely incur far greater trading costs by trying to actually build it from the bottom up by dipping into the bond market rather than buying the similar ETF. But before we go any further, I need to discuss a little bit about the bond market in general because the first ETFs were really created for the equity market and fixed income ETFs have been a tremendous addition, but they're unfortunately stuck with this outdated bond market. In comparison, the equity market trading is highly centralized. All parties have transaction information. But in comparison, the fixed income market is extremely disjointed. There is no central source of liquidity. And participants in the fixed income market realistically have very different levels of access to inventory and pricing. And this creates real challenges when you want to try and price a bond. For example, if you wanted to ask a room of bond traders, what is the price of this bond right now, you could get five different answers and they could all be right. And so like equity ETFs, fixed income ETFs, they're listed and they're traded on public exchanges, which does bring some transparency and liquidity to the fixed income market. But my point that I'm really trying to get across here is that they are still stuck with an antiquated fixed income market. So bond indices, do they make sense? The first question to ask for a bond index is, what is plain vanilla? Of course, in equities, this is very easy to answer. It's an index that selects and weights securities by size, by market capitalization, that is. But what is the market cap of a bond? There isn't one. So for fixed income, we have to use something else. And plain vanilla and fixed income is a fund that selects and weights its securities by the market value of debt outstanding. So what does that look like when we actually implement it in a portfolio? Here I've got the exposure of an international ETF of sovereign bonds. And what we see is after a few slight adjustments, the more debt outstanding that a country has, the larger allocation that it earns in the, in the ETF. Now this is the exact opposite of how you or I would rationally lend money to anyone. If you had one prudent friend who came and borrowed money once in a blue moon, and one friend who came every other week, 
which one would you feel more comfortable loaning your money to? Of course, the prudent friend. But again, this is the exact opposite of what plain vanilla bond indices do. And that's how the vast majority of money is invested in fixed income ETFs. But keep in mind, there is no silver bullet here. There isn't, we can't just pick another form of alternative indexing and say that we want to wait by, by fundamentals. Um, because there is some questionable logic behind these plain vanilla bond indices, but really when we look at the performance history of all the alternative forms of indexing, they really haven't outperformed plain vanilla. So do consider some of the lack of logic in plain vanilla indices, but also recognize that the performance hasn't been an improvement. And tracking these bond indices is actually really hard. Some indices hold upwards of 8,000 bonds. Now, of course, an ETF that tracks an index like this isn't going to actually go out and hold all 8,000 bonds. Instead, they're going to create a representative sample. We call this optimization, and for good reason, it's extremely prevalent in fixed income ETFs. For example, the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index holds 8,000 bonds. The biggest ETF tracking this index is, goes by the ticker AGG. It's a $15 billion ETF but it only holds 2,000 holdings. So even with $15 billion and the economies of scale to back that, the fund doesn't go out and try and buy all 8,000 bonds that its index holds. It buys only about a quarter of them. And so you could expect reasonably as an investor, okay, if my ETF is only holding a quarter of the securities that are actually in its index, that its performance might deviate from that index. But when we look at the tracking difference result for this fund, how far is it actually, how far is its performance behind its index, we see the tracking difference is only 13 basis points. Now this fund charges eight basis points in fees. So the total amount of slippage, the total performance cost that we could attribute to this optimization is only five basis points at most for a fund that only holds a quarter of its underlying securities. Now I need to note this is successful optimization on a grand scale. Not all ETFs do it do such a great job of optimizing their portfolios. So what the red column here is highlighting is tracking difference. Tracking difference is the dif performance difference between the fund's net asset value and its index. So a simple example would be if I invest in a fund that tracks the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 100 returns 10% next year but my ETF only returns 9%, tracking difference there would be the 1% difference between those two figures. Now, if the ETF charges 1% in management fees, this is perfect. This is exactly what I expected. The performance of the index less the management fee. But the reality is that results never come in like this. And the reason why is because a fund's expense ratio is a sticker price. Tracking difference, on the other hand, accounts for real-world holding costs the real challenges that fixed income portfolio managers have to make when they're constructing their portfolio. How much do I optimize? Which bonds do I hold? And we can see the value of using tracking difference as a metric to assess ETFs if we compare HYG and JNK on the screen here. Now, if we were to make our decision purely on expense ratio alone, we'd go with JNK. It's only 10 basis points cheaper, but hey, why not if it's going to be for free? But when we look at tracking difference, it tells a completely different story. JNK, the fund with the lower expense ratio of the two, rather than trailing its index by its stated 40 basis points, it trails by more than twice that. In comparison, HYG trails by only 13 basis points, much less than its advertised sticker price. So again, one is accounting for real-world holding costs, and one is a sticker price. So the takeaway here is really that the bond market is difficult, and expense ratio tells a different story than tracking difference. So check expense ratio, but recognize the robustness of tracking difference and its value in assessing real-world holding costs. Because it may be worth differentiating between portfolio teams with results instead of sticker prices. Now before we go on to the next section, I should note that most of the tracking challenges that I'm talking about pertain mainly to physically backed ETFs. And the reason is because they must actually procure their, their underlying securities from the bond market. 
Synthetically backed ETFs, on the other hand, they hold collateral, but it's not necessarily the bonds contained in their underlying index. And that's why synthetically backed ETFs have been popular in some difficult to access markets. Okay, moving on. Liquidity and bond ETFs. Three closely related things to keep track of here. Spreads, market depth, and order types. When we consider the liquidity pyramid of fixed income ETFs, the bottom layer is what we had before fixed income ETFs came to the market. We just had the primary market. If you wanted fixed income exposure, you had to trade in the primary market. But what we find now is actually these additional two layers. So the very top one that says secondary market, this is quite literally your observable on-screen volume. This is what you would see if you log into your online brokerage account and look at the average daily volume of an ETF. Now below that, we have an ETF's market depth. We have contingent liquidity. This is liquidity that's accessed by using limit orders, where you set them above or below current market prices. And this takes advantage of the flexibility of ETF supply and demand at varying price levels. In these instances, tactical trading flows can be triggered at prices outside of current market price. So the advantage that ETFs really bring to the bond market in terms of liquidity is in these first two layers. And a pyramid that might look like this would be for a sovereign bond ETF. Because let's consider this liquidity spectrum. Sovereign bonds are at the highly end of a liquidity spectrum. So even when there's significant volume of transactions in ETFs tracking these markets, it's unlikely to match the volume and size of the actual under, underlying market. But as we move down the liquidity spectrum, ETFs are increasingly effective in improving upon the liquidity of the underlying market. Consider it lower hanging fruit, if you will. But as you move down the spectrum, the ills and sins of the bond market that we discussed earlier, the fact that it's disjointed, the fact that it's not centralized, these all become more apparent as we move to less liquid segments of the market, where trades occur less frequently, which decreases the incentive and ability for market makers to maintain a competitive market. Now this is where ETFs come in, because they can actually exhibit what I like to call transcendent liquidity, where the liquidity of the ETF actually exceeds the liquidity of the underlying market. So what we did here was inverted the pyramid from two slides back. Now before the original pyramid, when it was right side up, we said that could be a sovereign bond market, because the underlying market is very, very deep. But now with the inverted pyramid, a market segment that might look like this could be high yield, high yield fixed income ETFs. Because once an ETF gains a critical mass in exchange liquidity, it becomes possible to execute large trades on an exchange without ever having to access the underlying market. So we can have an ETF that is all around more liquid than its underlying. And we actually see this in several segments of the fixed income market, especially as we move down the liquidity spectrum. Now this is a huge benefit to anyone who uses ETFs, but particularly for institutional investors who often use their size to directly access the underlying market. Unfortunately though, if the underlying market is small, these big institutional investors are stuck. But with the transcendent liquidity that ETFs bring to some segments of the less liquid corners of the fixed income market, institutional investors can trade in size where they previously could not. Meanwhile, the rest of us get the benefit of a competitive market and lower trading costs. Now the takeaway here is really to consider ETFs for all segments of the fixed income market as they do bring a lot to the table. And to evaluate if an ETF is the right way to go, consider the spreads and market depth of the ETF in comparison to the underlying market. And also consider the benefits of instantaneous implementation, the fact that you can execute that right now. And lastly, use limit orders to contain trading costs and to unlock contingent liquidity. So moving on from liquidity, I want to discuss premiums and discounts in bond ETFs as price discovery vehicles. So earlier we talked about tracking difference. And again, tracking difference was the performance difference between a fund's net asset value and its index. But now we're going to talk about premiums and discounts. Premiums and discounts are the difference between a fund's net asset value and its price. When price is bigger, greater than NAV, we call it a premium. And when price is less than NAV, we call it a discount. 
And we mentioned that ETFs are admired for trading close to their actual net asset value, aka there's minimum premiums and discounts. But fixed income ETFs are a little bit different because there are more consistent premiums and discounts, especially in the less liquid segments of the fixed income market. And this has led to some confusion, understandably. And it's, there's misplaced blame now in ETFs when the real problem is the underlying bond market, those challenges that we discussed before. And again, this has nothing to do with the ETF and everything to do with how bond prices are reported. Remember how the bond market is disjointed and decentralized relative to equity markets and how some bonds go days at a time without trading? This leads to real problems when we're trying to determine a fund's net asset value. Because the only real way to know the value of a bond is to see what the market is willing to pay for it. But what if the bond hasn't traded in three days? What is its value then? Well, a valuation service will look at that bond and they'll look at several metrics that are closely correlated and they'll arrive at an estimate of what the bond might trade at. But again, this is only an estimate. So my question for you is, what if the ETF is already telling us what the market is willing to pay for that particular portfolio of bonds? After all, we have daily transparency as to what these bonds are holding, so why wouldn't hundreds of thousands of market participants with a vested interest in knowing the right value have a better idea? And we see this happen more frequently as we move down the liquidity spectrum into the less liquid segments of the fixed income market. As we move from a portfolio of highly liquid U.S. Treasuries all the way down into international sovereigns to high yield emerging market corporate debt, we see that premiums and discounts are measured on a much larger scale. So is there really a breakdown in the creation and redemption mechanism that elsewhere always keeps ETFs in line with their net asset value? Or is there something else at play here? And the results really suggest that there's a, there's a problem with NAV. And they're less salient, these issues are less salient in the more liquid segments of the fixed income market where we have consistent trade data from which to gauge prices. For sovereign bonds, for example, as they trade all day, it's very easy to say what is the price of the bond today. But again, for those segments of the fixed income market that haven't traded in three, four, even a week at a time, it's very difficult to gauge prices. And we see this exactly as, as fixed income investors continue to trade ETFs even when premiums and discounts are present. Ordinarily, nobody would want to jump in and buy an ETF at a premium because nobody likes to overpay. And similarly, nobody would want to sell an ETF at a discount because nobody likes to sell their goods for less than worth. Yet repeatedly, investors continue trading even during premiums and discounts. And I guess another question for you would be, could this be because the price of the ETF is actually a better gauge of the value of that particular portfolio of bonds, i.e., these bonds are actually, these fixed income ETFs are actually price discovery vehicles. Now there's been great work done on this topic by Matt Tuckers and some others in the space. And the statistical analysis here really shows that ETF market prices and NAVs have a co-integrated relationship. This is a fancy way of saying that ETF market price may lead index values in NAV. And it may not. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. What we can conclude is that the ETF market price contains information with respect to the level and path of the underlying bond market. So in short, they can be price discovery tools sometimes. Therefore, investors should look skeptically at premiums and discounts in fixed income ETFs and assess whether they think the fund is truly selling for more or less than it's worth or whether the estimates of value are what is actually falling short. Tying all of what we've talked about together, when we think about the advantages of executing a fixed income strategy with an ETF, we can really think first about the advantages that exchange and contingent liquidity bring to the bond market and how that reduces trading costs. Second, the benefit from speedy implementation of strategies. And third, the benefit that stems from the opportunity to access instant diversification. What I want to leave you with here today is Fixed income in the bond market in general is an ugly asset class, and some of that passes through to bond ETFs. In all instances, though, the challenges of bond ETFs are fewer or equal to the challenges of the actual bond market. You need to be careful, but there are a ton of ETF options for practically every segment of the fixed income market. 
check them out. Evaluate the strategy, evaluate the liquidity, trade carefully, monitor tracking difference, be scrupulous of premiums and discounts. Ultimately, ETFs are wonderful things, but fixed income is not. You've got to be careful, but you can do well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you very much indeed, Spencer. Um, and thank you, ETS.com, for inviting me to describe how I use fixed interest ETF. My favorite work is to support people who want to self-manage their own long-term financial health. Promoting long-only ETFs since 2009, I've come to judge their qualities fit well with what ordinary investors appreciate. For instance, just today I have an example of a bond project for a client. He's not typical of my clients, but his project is. He's a tea planter in Kenya, and his son having died in a private plane crash, my client is running a portfolio for the maintenance and education of his grandchildren. He'd prefer to sell equities too early than too late, and he's exploring short duration bond ETF because they're the most resistant to changes in interest rates. I've sifted the 49 bond funds listed on the London Stock Exchange, and from those I've filtered 10 and sent him the fact sheets and the kids. He's now considering them, and he might or he might not confer with me before he buys. Now Rachel has asked me to respond to five questions. What do I want fixed interest ETF for? How much do I use them? How many do I use regularly? How do I select them? How do I avoid trading risks? So the first question, when equities are rising without fear and bonds are supposedly past their long-term best and inflation is stalking us in our ordinary lives, even if central bankers say it isn't, and when interest rates are sure to go up sometime, aren't fixed interest ETF for waste of money? The statistics suggest not. A fortnight ago, Rachel wrote about the London Stock Exchange figures for the top 20 ETF for the first six months of the year. 21% of all trades were bond transactions. That's 70,000 out of 330,000. And also surprising, to me anyway, were that there were six bond ETF in the top 20. So the highest there was at number five, a Euro high yield corporate ETF. Of course, the trades are mostly institutional, not retail. But what the figures suggest to me is that the big investors are buying bond ETF for hedging short-term positions. My own line of work is very different from theirs, and in my own environment, I like bonds for three reasons. To preserve real value against either deflation or inflation, to sweeten the income, and as a refuge from equity jeopardy. And I acknowledge that cash too is such a, such a refuge. So how much do I use fixed interest ETF given that I have those three reasons. The short answer is that almost every client of mine has one, has a bond ETF, and some have more. I find long only ETF are ideal because they're inexpensive to buy, easy to understand, easy to see what's in them, and very easy to monitor. Of course, the number of bond funds in a client's portfolio depends on his project. The young adults, and believe me, they're coming into these fast now, they recognize it, they get ETF. But the young adult clients tend to have no bond ETF because they have time on their side. The most intrepid also tend to have none because their interest is in equities and they tend to be happy to dodge in and out of cash. But most of my clients are buyers to hold their common aim is to increase the value of their capital, and they also want the pleasure of controlling it at low cost 
with, a, with the least tedious research and the smallest admin burden. They usually agree to hold at least one bond ETF because it offers them balance and learning and as, so that when times get tough, they'll already be familiar with how a bond fund behaves. Third question, how many ETFs do I regularly use? Well, there are 1,600 ETFs on the London Stock Exchange of all kinds, and clearly that's too many for people who want to self-manage their own financial long-term health, too many for them to sift. And it was easy for me to cut out the inverse and the leveraged and the overcomplicated, and that left 500. And for about four years now, some guinea pig clients have willingly helped me to refine my service, so that now I have not a lake, but a pool of 40 indices, and it contains seven bond funds. Here they are. How many of them coincide with the six in the top 20? Well, the top three don't match, but some they overlap. As you can see, the Euro corporate one to five year excluding financial, that overlaps with one of them. I've chosen that fund because it's bigger than a billion pounds, and I've put it in the group of five funds that out of the 40, the 40 are divided into eight different groups of five, and one group of five is of, is of ETF all bigger than one billion pounds. I called it the dreadnought group, and people like it when they, they tend to buy from that group when they know that they're going to buy and hold and never pay any attention. It's the second one, the sterling corporate bond, I've got in a group called endurance for people who do want to pay attention now and again and, and manage to, but they're busy, but perhaps they don't spend as much time as they'd like to. So as a home nation sterling corporate bond that's enduringly popular, that fits. The third one there, the UK gilt, is in my out of fashion group because it has been and is now emerging from that out of fashion group. The other four are not in the top 20. And the first three, the, the top three of those, numbers four, five, and six, you'll see are all index linked. I've chosen them to go into what I call my capital preserver group because that's the people who want nothing more than to preserve the real value of their capital. And the last one, Emerging Markets Corporate, I've chosen, and it too is in the out of fashion, the unloved group, because that's where it's been. And I've chosen it because I'm told, well, I've read in several places, that the demographic strength of emerging markets will serve it well between now and 2050. How do I select fixed interest ETF? For me, one of the handsome qualities of ETF is that they lend themselves to a very transparent process of elimination. Of the 5,660 ETP in the world yesterday, 10% of them are fixed interest of one kind or another. In the UK, there are those 1,600 ETP listed on the London Stock Exchange, and of those, 500 are long only, and of those, 10% are fixed interest. For me, as a simple IFA, there are enough of them to cover all the bases that I need. So far, five companies have issued fixed interest ETF. Here they are. No, not that. Not there they are. So far, five. I feel sad that one company has got domination of the market, and I feel sad because I judge ETF investors will feel better served when that company has a smaller slice of a much bigger pie. It's coming, slowly. Knowing that the regulator is supportive of ETF, but also rightfully hot on due diligence, I've taken a lot of care in the process of choosing the funds that I use. In the, among the 49 that there are, this table, this next table here, looks a little busy, but what it shows is that across the four main classes of ETF, 
and among the five main sectors, there are funds everywhere in every, in every cell so that a UK retail client is likely to want at any stage. In America, bond ETF have become so popular that new funds are launched every month. One journalist I've read compares the fashion to new Coke, each new version being only a minor twist of the old one. I've asked my clients, and they tell me they'll always regard the basic bond sector as sufficient for their needs. I judge they're not any more willing to try American-style innovations than Coke with Lime. Question five, how do I avert trading risks? My experience of people new to ETF is that when they understand what's going on, then they're in control and they realize that. They like that being in control and they become very willing to exchange a little of their time from week to week to save quite a lot of money and they become tolerant of risk. So small are retailing, retail transactions compared to institutional and so much more long term are the holdings that I regard the trading risks as small and not an obstacle smaller than the currency risk and much smaller than the interest rate risk. Of course, pension fund managers are understandably sensitive to transaction costs. And of course, I want my clients to, be at, to buy at a good price. But modern at best trading engages within seconds a lot more competition between market makers than ever a retail client could command by himself. So in conclusion, I not only remain a supporter of fixed interest ETF, but I become increasingly mindful of their timeliness in the present. The prevailing conditions now remind me of how I felt in 2007, more vigilant to keep clients, to help clients rather, to take their money off the table than to put more on. And shall we have more disinflation before we suffer inflation? As nobody knows the answer to that question, I remain committed to a wide diversification between all asset classes and many sectors. Uh, that's the one I wanted to leave you with. Rachel, that's me. I'm finished. I'll give you back to Rachel. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks, Spencer. That was really comprehensive. And um, we've had quite a few questions coming through from the audience. So we're all, all three of us are live on air now. So um, let's start with the first question which came through. With this, this was actually during my presentation. And the question was talking about costs and said, is this simply just TER, total expense ratio and spread? Um, so there are other costs to consider, as I mentioned. Um, and I don't know if, Spencer, you wanted to, you mentioned this too, if you wanted to just give a quick roundup of what the costs are um, that should be on our list as well as the TER. Is it just the spread, or are there anything else we should be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other thing that's going to come into mind is your, your brokerage expenses. So whatever your broker charges to uh, trade the ETFs, usually $8 or something like that, um, here in the US anyways. Um, and then the other distinction I really want to make between the TER plus spread, that's totally an accurate, um, accurate equation. I just want to note the time horizon importance of how much you weight the two. Because a spread is going to be something you're going to pay. It's basically one-off cost. You're going to pay it when you get in and when you get out. But the TER you're going to pay every year. So depending on your time horizon depends on how much you care about them. You don't necessarily care about them equally. If you have a really long time horizon, you're going to care about the fee that gets charged every single year um, a lot more than you are the one-off cost of entering and exiting the fund. Um, and if you have an extremely short horizon, if you're trading in and out within the week, obviously the spread is going to be hugely important in comparison to the yearly expenses, which you'll hardly incur within a week. Yeah, absolutely. And that is a nice segue onto another question. Um, because really it comes down to what costs you incur is also comes down to your time horizon and how you use these ETFs. And a question has come through here. How would you advise investors to use these products? Are they tradable or is it better to buy and hold? And I guess that comes down to various factors. Stephen, what's your opinion? Mm, I, I'm, 
my clients tell me that they're not keen to trade, uh, and I discourage them from trading often, but that that's because my market is the inexpert retail investor who has a lot of enthusiasm and keenness but doesn't yet know very much. There must be many people living in London and working in the city who are much more capable and, and very competent traders. But the, my experience of my clients is that they settle down quite quickly and they learn to buy and hold and they learn to think more about when, when do I want to come out? When is the time where I think the volatility has become a plate, uh, has reached a point where I don't feel comfortable anymore? That, for me, is more, more important than dodging in and out of the market. Yeah. And when it comes to minimum investment, uh, somebody who's listening in has asked, is there a minimum investment with bond ETFs? Um, Spencer, is it not just the price of a share? That's exactly it, yeah. Whatever the handle is on that particular fixed income ETF. It would be lousy value, of course, to buy one. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I'd love it if only we could do here in UK what's happened in America where, where people can be buying commission-free at least some ETF. It would really change the game for ETF in this country if if a broker, if an online broker, would get together with a company to to provide commission-free trading, especially for monthly savers. Well, that would be big news if you hear of it. Tell me. Um, mm. The next question is allocation of fixed income in the portfolio. And so I guess it's all very well to choose which ones you want, but how much should you actually allocate to fixed income and subsectors of that asset class in the first place? Uh, Stephen, I'd like to ask you that. Mm. Well, I'm sorry, that question is begging for a, a, an explicit answer, and of course there isn't one, because it depends on so many factors. Um, and, and some people, in my experience, just aren't interested in bonds. Um, I, have a, I have a client who's got four million pounds invested and he wouldn't touch a bond. I've got uh, a couple of retired clients with their pensions that they've not yet taken, so they've converted them into SIPs, and, and they've got the 30% the, uh, the or so that, uh, that some strategists recommend. So I wish I could give an answer explicitly to that to that person with that question, but I'm afraid there isn't one. That's the art of investing. That's okay. We'll let you off. Um, next question for Spencer, I think. Liquidity is obviously a massive issue, um, and there's a lot of media headlines, perhaps, about lack of liquidity and fixed income. Um, but what is the reality of that? And if we saw markets tanking, what are the issues in getting out of your fixed income ETF? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot that's been said about this recently, especially in some particularly illiquid corners of the market that have ETFs that are highly liquid. So I think the, the big concern here has been, for example, in bank loans. So there's some ETFs that have massive assets under management for what's really a pretty small underlying market and what happens if those ETF investors head for the exits. Of course, if there's a stampede out of a small asset class like anything, of it could severely depress prices, no doubt. Um, as I talked about, some people would point to the ETF trading below its net asset value, so it's trading at a discount and forcing investors to sell into a discount, really what they don't want to do. Um, I've pointed that to being a negative thing, and the reality is that those underlying markets in those particular moments aren't even trading. When, when it becomes so one-sided that everyone's trying to rush out, you're not going to be able to go and trade bank loans anyways because nobody is going to, you're not going to find a buyer anywhere. So is it painful that you might have to sell at such a depressed price should you decide to exit your position in the middle of a stampede? Absolutely it hurts. But the alternative of working with the fixed income market is far worse. Yeah, and on that note, people often say you know ETFs are as liquid or illiquid as the underlying holdings, but then I also hear that you can have an ETF of corporate bonds, 
and it works the other way. The ETF is more liquid than the underlying holdings. So how does that all fit into what you've just said? Absolutely. As long as investors are trading between each other, so as long as the trading is, is two ways, which it is, you know, 363 days out of 365 days in the year. Okay, not that many trading days in the year, but you get the point. Um, as long as there's buyers and sellers on the exchange, you don't need to actually access the underlying market via the creation and redemption mechanism. Um, but of course, if the trading becomes one-sided and you have to actually access the underlying market, that's when an ETF that is transcendently liquid, so it's more liquid than its underlying market, um, could actually run into, I don't want to say problems because there's no problems, but again, prices could be depressed. Yep. And when it comes to replication, we did touch on how many in the market are physical and how many are synthetic, but I'm interested to hear more, as our listeners are, about what does it actually come down to? What should investors focus on? Is there a preference? Is there pros and cons to both? Um, Stephen, what's your preference? Can you talk us through that? My preference, actually, is for synthetic. I know that I'm swimming against the tide when I say that, but I love the simplicity of synthetic. And I really don't see that the risk, this counterparty risk that keeps being trotted out, is anything like the size that the, that the head of iShares wanted us all to believe when he told us that synthetic is dangerous two years ago. We're still, we still haven't had uh, a synthetic problem, and and I am a great fan of synthetic ETF. I very much like physical ones too. I really like physical. But if you asked me to buy to choose between a synthetic and a physical fund, which were the same in all other ways, uh, then I would happily choose the synthetic and. And the figures that I have, I haven't got them to hand, I'm sorry, but uh, the figures that I have uh, would show that synthetic funds are really doing very nicely. That's my And so you might have a, a slightly different um, perspective on that when it comes to um, physical and synthetic. To some degree, but I agree with Stephen that a lot of it, it's been overblown, absolutely, the difference between synthetic and physical. Um, I mean, the real, the real thing to weigh here is synthetically backed ETFs have a bit of a tracking advantage in less liquid asset classes um, because they don't need to actually go out and procure their securities from the market. Like we talked about, for the example, for an index that has 8,000 bonds, the ETF only holds about a quarter of them. A physically, I mean, a synthetically backed ETF isn't going to have this problem at all of how much of the index do I actually hold. They, read it, they buy a futures contract on the index and your tracking difference is going to be very predictable. Um, and so basically with the synthetically backed ETF, you get a little bit more predictable tracking difference. And with a physically backed ETF, of course, people get the relative psychological assurance that they own a piece of a pie that actually exists. Of course, synthetically backed ETFs are backed by collateral as well. So you do own a piece of a pie of value. It's just not the securities that your, that the ETF is tracking. Yeah. And when it comes to counterparty risk, um, obviously that's something that affects investment vehicles like, you know, structured products. The bond is issued from a certain institution and we have to judge how robust that is. So what are the basics? How do you actually judge counterparty risk? Is it relevant when it comes to investing in these kind of ETFs, Spencer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can be. In general, what we see is that most of these issuers are extremely at least the market sees them as extremely low risk. And the way to really measure that is by looking up the credit default swaps on these, fun on these companies. Um, so if you've got a, um, you know, a note coming out of Barclays, um, go ahead and check out the five-year, the 10-year credit default swap, or three-year, um, depending on your time horizon. And that should give you a pretty good gauge of at least what the market gauges as counterparty risk. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, Stephen, when it comes to assessing ETFs, obviously you've put together your own system. Um, mm -hmm. Seems like a lot of work in a way, so thank you for doing that for us. But what other sources do we have? Obviously we can use your service, but can we purely rely on the provider's website to tell us what we need to know? Oh, I think that the provider's websites are brilliant, and I greatly admire the, 
the extent to which they uh, they work to be as transparent as possible. If there's one quality about the ETF community that I think is just so brilliant, it's the it's the quality of integrity and accountability, uh, uh, the the willingness to to reveal information uh, to investors, and I think that counts for a hell of a lot, uh, especially in these days where. Uh, a lot of people in the financial world have been discredited for poor integrity and lack of accountability. So I greatly admire all of the ETF issuers' websites. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're all easy to interpret. Uh, and of course, they don't compare their funds with other companies' funds. So it would be very good if we could have more uh, if we could have more companies, more IFAs like me, and more companies willing to uh, create comparisons. Um, I'm just about to buy uh, something from Market, which will do a lot of that for me, but it's going to cost me £6,000 a year. Uh, I, I, uh, it's not cheap, but it'll be very worthwhile. Okay, and I think one last question to both of you, actually. We've talked a lot about how to pick an ETF, but we obviously know that monitoring that investment on an ongoing basis is also important. So in a nutshell, what are we monitoring, and how do we do that, and where is the best place to do that? Stephen, I'll start with you. The best place for monitoring the performance of your portfolio? Well, it depends to some extent on what you want to compare it with, and are you wanting to compare it with its peers, or with a benchmark of your choice, or with a an active fund that is in a similar field? It it depends. I mean, there are there are wonderful sites where you can do that. Morningstar, in particular, I think is about as close as one can get for for uh, monitoring portfolio, and the very brilliant uh, blogger, Moneyvator, has a lot about that. And if anybody wanted to, uh, to, to, to learn more about how best to, to, to monitor their own choices, I, I recommend them to Moneyvator. Thank you. And Spencer, what should we be monitoring on an ongoing basis? As far as your ETF portfolio? Yeah, if you've made an investment in a fixed income ETF, do you just ignore it, put it in the cupboard, or what are we watching out for while you hold it? Um, again, not to harp on my same point again, but I would bring it back to tracking difference. I mean, a fund is stating, again, we talked a little bit about how expense ratio is a sticker price. So is your fund actually living up to what it says it's going to do? Does it do what it says on the 10? Um, you know, if you're going to be holding the fund for 10 years, it could be worth a year from now and two years from now checking in to make sure that tracking difference is roughly in line with the fund's expense ratio. And if it's vastly more and there's a lower cost option available, you might want to switch. Um, and the other thing is ongoing innovation in the space and that new products are constantly available. And as you know, there's a, a fee war going on between many of the issuers where in, it's a race to the bottom to provide the lowest cost ETF. Um, and so, I mean, always evaluating the options that, are, that have become available since you made your allocation is, is a good choice to see uh, if there's a lower cost, cost product um, that could be a better fit. Of course, you need to weigh in the costs of trading out of your ETF and trading into that one. But depending on your time horizon, that could absolutely be a good decision. Great. Well, I'd like to thank both of you, Stephen and Spencer. I think that was a really comprehensive overview of fixed income. We'll be doing more of these webinars in the future, so do tune back in. And our playback will be um, on our website within 24 hours. So thank you for listening to ETF.com. Thank you, Rachel. Bye-bye.